So I'll be reviewing the paper I linked um, called Deep Learning for Genomics, a concise overview. Um, and I'll just start off with sort of what motivated me to read this particular paper and like my um, perspective reading it. So I do a little um, research of deep learning like outside of work in genomics. I've kind of practiced a little bit with it. Um, and so for me, this paper was sort of bridging together two topics that I'm familiar with separately. So I've, I've seen like applications of deep learning. And I've obviously done work with genomics, but not like, I haven't seen how those things come together. So that's sort of what interested me in this paper. Um, and in terms of approaching it, normally we might like in a typical paper, we might just read the abstract, look at some figures, and then look for major results and sort of move from there. This paper was a little different. It didn't have any figures at all. Um, and for me, uh, sort of conceptually, uh, I saw this paper as having three pieces. So they started with talking about deep learning architectures, which is sort of how the neural networks they talk about are structured for different applications. Um, they, didn't, they sort of assumed a lot of prior knowledge about that. Anyways, I'll get into that more later. Um, the, sep the second se section was um, genomics applications of deep learning. And then at the very end, they talked about like future directions with where deep learning could go in genomics. And of course, I took interest in certain sections based on what I was familiar with already. Um, and then we can get into that. Um, the actual paper now. So uh, I'll just go through and sort of talk about sections um, I looked at in more detail and stuff I highlighted. Um, so in the beginning, like I said, they sort of talk about different um, deep learning architectures. And the first thing that caught my interest was something about um, convolutional neural networks. So convolutional neural networks are sort of famously they were invented for image processing, and they're good at sort of taking information that is um, in an image. They sort of scan the image in sort of chunks um, so they can process information locally and sort of form it together into, a, um, into features of interest. Anyways, sort of how they mentioned the application in genomics. So, um, Instead of sort of scanning an image, they're talking about directly reading a genomic sequence and sort of what that would pick up on is like sort of patterns that recur and have some sort of meaning for the um, whatever you're studying. So it would be interesting to see these, um, to look more into how these are applied in that, that way, looking for you know genomic patterns that have some sort of significance. Um, talk about a, lot, a bunch of other architectures that I'm not, I'm a little, I'm like, I know a little bit about these things, but not enough to really get that much out of the paper. <laughs> so I'll just skip through um, the next, let's see what the next thing was. Oh, so it made some interesting points. So this, this point right here, um, is that it's sort of like a common criticism of neural networks as compared with other approaches. So sometimes it's important to just, from taking from the model directly, you wanna be able to get some sort of insight. Um, so for example, like in regression, you can just take the coefficients and usually the coefficients right away tell you something of interest, um, like a positive coefficient in a linear model obviously represents a positive relationship stuff like that. Um, a criticism of neural networks is that like, even though the model might learn something and be highly accurate in what it's supposed to predict, it's sort of hard to interpret um, what the, the network has learned um, just by looking at the, the parameters. Um, so that's just a point that they briefly touch on. Um, And they get into this thing here was interesting. So they, they talk about transfer learning. So just a little bit of background. Transfer learning is sort of a technique where 
um, you may teach a neural network to do one task and um, with the goal that you actually want to. So there, let's say you, you teach it to um, learn to be good at one task and on a second task you, you sort of, um, you train it afterward and it's supposed to perform better. Um, the first task sort of preconditions it for learning the second task better. So to make that a little bit more concrete, um, like I'll do, I'll give an example of like how it works for humans. Um, so let's say you um, were learning to ride a motorcycle. Okay. So if, one, once you learned how to ride a motorcycle, when you, if you've never driven a car before, but you start after learning to ride a motorcycle, you'll be a lot better at, um, you'll probably pick that up a lot more quickly than if you had just started by driving a car. Um, it's kind of a weird example, but this, the same concept actually applies with um, deep learning. So with neural networks, so they can actually perform better when they're preconditioned with a particular task. And the interesting point they make here is that like sometimes the reason you might want to do this is that the, the task of interest might actually not have very much data or it may be very expensive to obtain. So you may pre-train a neural network on a, a task where you have a lot more data and it's easier to obtain. And that way you don't have to have as much data for the second task. Um, and it can learn that a lot better um, when the you'd otherwise have limitations. That's something that's kind of interesting. Um, and now to get to the actual sort of genomics applications in particular, um, they mentioned something about gene expression. So um, this point in particular interests me obviously because we, we use a lot, of, a lot of linear regression for modeling gene expression. And so they referenced a paper where um, a neural network was used to do something similar and achieved better performance. Um, so let's assume it. Uh, windows in my way. Uh, one sec. Okay. Um, where's my comma on this? I just went back down. Whoops. Um, where was I? All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I actually took a little bit of look at the abstract that they for this paper that they linked, and. Um, they made an interesting point. Basically, um, they were saying that the limitations of linear regression is that it is that it's not really able to capture complex nonlinear relationships between expressions of genes, um, just in the fact that it's a linear model, um, and neural networks would are able to sort of capture more complex relationships when you have like correlations between input variables and stuff like that. Um, that's just like one thing to note about neural networks versus other sorts of models. Um, and as for a, a specific application, they were talking about being able to predict promoter sites um, and E. coli. I'm not familiar with how, um, how promoter sites are identified normally, but um, it seems pretty interesting. Um, or I guess I'm not familiar with like the typical statistical modeling that we do for that kind of thing, but I imagine neural networks would be pretty good at that. And they, they sort of get into that. It seems to be an effective way to approach it. Um, sort of similarly, there was a comment about um, splicing. So in this section, they were talking about um, sort of, I guess, feeding a neural network a the raw genomic sequence and it was the goal would be to predict where splicing sites um, occur or just um, how spli splicing is regulated in general um, since that's sort of a difficult and obviously relevant problem um, and basically I say like they took half a million RNA or mRNA splicing code um, in the human genome and they were able to correctly um, identify known sites, and then also discover new disease-causing disease candidates. Um, so that's, a, that's an example where I guess there's already a 
huge amount of data out there. So um, neural networks can perform obviously very well when they have a huge amount of data. Um, and then also an interesting point was that like, not only can you identify splice sites, but you can also like predict which ones may be like non-canonical um, variations. Um, so you can actually sort of do a lot with, um, just based on how you structure your neural network, you can sort of look at different angles of a problem. Um, okay. And the next thing was that just caught my eye. Um, just because I know we do some of this with spatial transcriptomic, transcriptomics. Um, so, and obviously one of the interests we have is like sort of segmenting images. I know we do that, a lot of that. Um, that's like a common problem that neural networks do, especially convolutional neural networks, like I mentioned earlier. Um, but that may be like, that's a, like an obvious area where um, deep learning could be applied. Um, segmenting images in different ways. Although I guess sometimes like more conventional models actually do well enough for that kind of thing, but it's just like, um, I guess an alternative. Um, okay. They go into this section, which I thought wasn't, it's not really, I don't think we, it's too relevant for what we do, but it was, it was interesting. So they talk about um, protein secondary and tertiary structure. So like um, a problem that deep learning has been applied to is predicting how proteins are going to fold based on the raw sequence. Um, and obviously that'd be relevant for like drug discovery and that kind of thing if um, we're able to predict how proteins um, fold because that's that indicates how they're gonna function and how they bind and stuff like that, um, which is kind of interesting. I don't think we do too much of that here, but it's like, I don't know, it's a cool point. And so in the final section, they, they mention um, sort of, I guess, limitations and then like future directions. But some of this struck me as like um, not specific to deep learning. It just seemed like they were talking about like this point here. Um, they're saying a challenge is unavail unavailability of true labels um, due to lack of knowledge of a genetic process, imbalanced case and control. Um, and these problems, like, this is more of like a statistics and data science problem in general, I feel, because um, it, it affects any sort of model you'd be using, not just deep learning, but still it's worth noting. Um, go more into detail of that. I think it may have been my last, uh, yeah, that sort of ends the paper there. Um, but yeah, I'll go back to the, the uh, <laughs> this and um, so I guess like general takeaways that we can get from this paper. Um, so deep learning can model complex relationships with really good accuracy and a lot of problems. So times where you might consider are when input variables are correlated or the relationship between them is nonlinear or very complicated. Um, but an important point to note is that when simpler models are, are sufficient, they're often better. Um, it's sort of tempting to apply deep learning anywhere you can because it seems like when you see the kind of stuff that deep learning can do, it's like it seems like um, you can just be tempted to try to apply it to everything. And often, when you have a simpler model, it's superior. And one of the reasons is that um, deep neural networks can overfit. If you're not familiar with overfitting, um, it's where you it can be described as where you um, if you're training a model on some sort of set of data, um, it sort of learns to memorize that data. And then when you apply it to new data it hasn't seen yet, it performs very poorly. So it's, it's really not generalizing anything. Um, it's not learning sort of what it should. It's just learning to memorize. Um, and that's a big problem because deep neural networks have a huge number of parameters compared to other um, approaches. And like we talked about, they can be less interpretable than other types of models. Um, so it's just something to note. It can be tempting to over apply deep learning. 
Um, and then obviously as I covered, there are like a few areas of analysis where I know we could be, um, neural networks might, could be an appropriate models, model for the data. Um, but like actually identifying specific projects will probably require more discussion. And it's just like good to keep an eye out for problems that you guys see that you think might be um, good to approach with deep learning. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it, I guess. Awesome, thank you, Nick.